Welcome to Worlds Apart. Freedom of speech is one of the pillars of democracy and also the one that in the West is perceived as being in greatest peril. With the left claiming that it has become a vehicle co-opted by the right to spread hate and the right deriding the left as sinister snowflake censors, just what are the boundaries of free speech? Well, to discuss that, I'm now joined by British activist Tommy Robinson. Mr. Robinson, it's good to see you. Thank you very much for coming over. It's good to be seen. Now, what brings you to, to Russia? I'm giving a presentation tomorrow to explain the history and the dangers of what's called grooming, which is more of a rape jihad. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, speaking uh, about the topic of your talk, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it's titled The Rape of Britain. I know that you are prone to generalizations, but isn't that too broad and too threatening of a statement? No, it's not. And, um, Prone to generalizations, I say first, in my rape and discussion, I talk about Islam, not Muslims in general. Not if I, I always... How can you talk about Islam and not talk about Muslims in general? Because Islam's an idea. It's a book. It's an idea. To criticize that but idea... But it's practiced by Muslims. But if, I, but if I criticize Christianity, I'm not insulting or, or picking fault at every Christian. I'm picking fault at the idea. So when we see the rape levels that we've seen in our country, and from a population, Muslim males make up 2.2% of the British population. They are responsible for 84% of the convictions of this, talk, this type of rape. And what you have to ask the question is why, which we're not allowed to ask. Well, I think you pointed out uh, very specifically that it's this type of rape, and I, I suggest that we talk in more detail about uh, various kinds of rape. But before we do that, when I, hear, when I heard the title of your talk, The Rape of Britain, the immediate association that I got was with the book the Rape of Nanking. It's a, a very famous book describing six weeks in 1937 during which the Japanese forces killed at least 200,000 Chinese mean, civilians and raped 20,000, at least 20,000 Chinese women. Even with those races, uh, even with those cases that you're trying to highlight, the statistics, the rape statistics in, in Britain is nowhere near that. In um, fact, if you look at the statistics, Britain is pretty much on par with other developed countries. 19,000 children in 2018 were groomed by these gangs in one year. So when you talk about the rape of Britain, if I give you the, the statistics, we have a town called Telford. It has a 1.8% Muslim population. 1,000 children were raped by those gangs. Five have been murdered in that town alone. When you take the 1.8% and you take away under 16s and you take away over 65s, there's only 956 Muslim men in that town. The police, the police have identified 200 in Operation Chalice. That means that 21% of the Muslim men in that town have been in, involved in the rape and but, torture uh, of our daughters. Mr. Robinson, you refer to them as Muslims, but, you know, I'm not a Muslim myself, but yes. I'm married to a Muslim, okay. and I know for a fact that Islam imposes very strict limits on extramarital sex, not but, to mention rape. I mean, those people that are convicted of raping anyone, they would not be considered Muslims by Islam. Why do you have to tie it to If to you come faith? and see, if you, if my presentation I give tomorrow proves all of this, categorically proves it. It says four times in the Quran that outside of your four wives, you can take whatever the right arm possesses, sexual slaves. And I have, on my video, I will have, I will have imams and experts confirming what that means, sexual slaves. I also look at witness testimonies from the victims. And I also listened to what the perpetrators said in court. So the men, when they were sentenced in Rotherham, all of them chanted Allah Akbar. The comments they make were about, you know, if, if whilst we're on the grooming scandal, one of the girls they murdered, the day before he murdered her, he sent his friend a message saying he's sending that kafar to hell. But kafar this is being his understanding of uh, Islam, but I'm sure you would agree that there are hundreds of thousands, millions of Muslims who would be just totally. as no, totally. revolted uh, at course. the idea of uh, a girl or, a, you know, a, a boy or a child being raped as they are. And by referring to them as Muslims, you are no. also tainting those individuals because they subscribe to the Muslim faith as well. I'm not tainting them. What I'm saying is if 84% of convictions are Muslim males from 2.2%, why do you think that is? 
Well, well, I, why, why I, I, the massive... I don't know where you got th these statistics from because that's, I, from, that's from a qu that's from the Quilliam Foundation, which is a Muslim anti-extremism think tank. But I, I mean, the last time I checked, uh, British police actually does not keep track of the or does not release the ethnicity or the religious affiliation uh, of the perpetrators. Out, but... out of the out of the four hundred and four so far men who have been convicted for this type of, of rape. Again, you, you keep referring to this type of yes. rape, but I mean, Brothers, in, cousins, in, in, most work countries, colleagues. in most countries, uh, developed countries, and the UK is no exception here, the rape, uh, the majority of rapes are perpetrated by the locals, and in the uh, British case, it would be white males. Are you saying that a British girl being raped uh, by her British neighbour is somehow less offensive than a British girl being raped by her no, ethnic Pakistani no, neighbour? No, it's not. What I'm saying is that you have type 1 and type 2 in the UK, that's how it's known. Type 1 is where gangs of men who know each other, they're usually related in most of these cases, in every town and city, brothers, cousins, work colleagues. That has never happened in the UK. Out, out of those convictions, 0.5% have a British name. 0.5%. Now, when you were talking about type 2 paedophilia, that is lone paedophiles sharing their sexual fantasies with other lone paedophiles via the internet or grooming in that process. The, literally, exclusively, that is white. But that's because we live in an 87% white country. That hasn't been covered up. What we have seen, for example, in Manchester, a young girl was injected with heroin in 2003. She was 15 years old. She was murdered by a 50-year-old Muslim male who had, been, who had been grooming her and raping her. The police launched an investigation. Okay? They identified the perpetrators. Then in 2005, Colin Cramphorn shut down the investigation. Okay? He closed it. He was rewarded by the British state, a, a CBE, the biggest award you can get for hiding this fact. Then we had the, the, the investigation in Telford, where, where local politicians blocked an investigation. Mr. We've seen Robinson, it. We've seen I a can cover easily up. believe that uh, seen cover politicians up or local authorities could be covering that out of political correctness. But this, in every this town and city, if it was one town or, one, or, or two, but we have seen grooming gangs operating in 44 cities and we've seen every one of them. But look, that is an establishment. That is organized crime in all countries. And in many countries, Russia, for example, mm. prostitution rings or human trafficking rings are run by ethnically homogenous groups. It, it, Britain is no exception here. I know for a fact that there are many ethnic Russians involved in human trafficking in Western Europe, perhaps even the, in the UK. But there they're doing that not because they're Russians, they're doing that because they're criminals. Why are you portraying it as a religious issue rather than a criminal in one? My, in my presentation tomorrow, you'll hear from the, the victims. So the victims say it's racial and religious, the perpetrators say it's racial and religious, religi religious. The Quran and the scripture supports and justifies these actions That's against non-Muslims. simply not true. Or? It, it is true. And, and, and unfortunately, when we're talking about, we're not talking about sexual gratification here. We're talking about one young girl, 12 years old, had her, ta her, her tongue nailed to a table. Another young girl, they, hit, they heated up an iron rod with the letter M and they scolded it on her bum at 11 years old because she was the property of Mohammed. These girls are being tortured. I can take any book, I Ma can Ma take Ma Bible Ma and uh, use it as a, as a pretext for the ho most horrible crimes. If we but are you actually believing that those are the people of faith? I'm saying they're following the teachings of Mohammed. Mohammed had sexual slaves. Mohammed legitimized and, and had... Come on, I, I can tell you that Lot, uh, from, from, you know, it's uh, explained Jesus, in the bi bi Bible, he slept with his daughters. Jesus, I mean, my, my, my but we are is, not using that in a literal sense. I mean... I, well, 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 what I look at tomorrow is what the victims were told. So I give the statement, we can have sex with you once you start your period. OK, then I question, let's have a look whether that is Islamic. For example, in Pakistan, they tried to ban underage marriage and it was found by the ideology of Islam that it was un-Islamic. Why would marrying a child and having sex with her, a child, be un-Islamic? We have had 30 children married in the borough of London, in, in, one, you know, in one borough of Islam London. Islam is a very large religion and there are many strains within Islam and some interpretations of Islam are indeed horrendous, well, as are... are some interpretations of the Bible. My problem with that is that, again, you would agree that there are many good people among Muslims. Of and course. those people course, could totally. be your allies. They could be the ones who would be looking after those uh, My... potential pr predators. But you are alienating them by suggesting that their faith is directly responsible for the crimes of those individuals. Boko Haram gave justification. Boko Haram, a terrorist organization in Nigeria, they give justification for kidnapping girls and enslaving them, saying it's quoted by Allah. Muhammad commands it. ISIS done exactly the same. ISIS are taking slaves, Boko Haram are taking slaves, and across every town and city in my country, they're taking slaves. My worry is, I'm, if we're worrying about me offending some people with my speech, 
A generation of my okay, daughters. Okay, let me give you a, another example. A generation example. of our daughters have been kidnapped you, and raped. You are a self-described British patriot, right? Yes. And I'm sure you know that the British legacy in some countries is, is pretty abhorrent. I mean, take the colonial crimes in Africa, in India. For, for example, just as recently as the 1950s, the British forces used rape and castration to put down uprisings in Kenya. They paid compensation uh, to the victims a few years back. Would it justify me to throw around labels like British killers or Anglican rapist at anyone who has any relation to the British identity. I don't live in the past, and I'm not throwing those accusations at every single Muslim. So, so it, that, that's it. for me, it's an irre irrelevant point. You, you are evading my question. Would that, would that justify me calling? anyone who has any relation to the British state, because it was the British army, the British forces who were uh, perpetrating those crimes, not just individuals, but actually the state institution that authorized this kind of treatment of people, would that justify me throwing that kind of labels to, at anyone who is connected to the British state? No, it wouldn't, but I'm not throwing those accusations at anyone that's connected but to the, Islam. But you're referring to them as Muslim rapists. No, they were Muslim rapists. But uh, I mean, how is it different from the British rapists then? Because these men are Muslims and they're rapists and they're raping young children. And th those men were also British and they were rapists and, you, and they and castrated individuals. I have no, I have no problem with you labelling those people who commit those crimes as British rapists. I don't, I, you don't have to tell no, me no, the No, 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 but I mean, the, we are talking about generalisations here. Because I'm not generalised. I'm talking about Islam. You, people have to get the understanding that Islam is an idea and Muhammad is its founder and we have a right to criticise and look at his life. Because when you look at his life and you see that he pillaged, he, he murdered, he raped, he, his, his wife, Sophia... There's a lot Sophia. of violence in, no, but, uh, in most but, holy but, books. But if you understand, say the Beslam, the Beslam school attack was what woke me up. That was my moment that changed I my... don't consider those people Muslims no, but, at all. But, I mean, those... OK, you don't, you don't, you don't, but with the Beslam school attack, as with... There was a Jewish tribe and they surrendered to Muhammad, yeah? And this is in their scripture, Sahih Bukhari. This is in Ibn Ishaq's book. Don't... But you have to understand the relevance of it. This is why it's so relevant, which I'll show tomorrow. Because when the Taliban took children in Pakistan, in Peshawar, when they put the, what Mohammed done when the Jews surrendered, he pulled their pants down. Whoever had, had pubic hairs was beheaded. But That's Mr. Exactly Robinson, the, as somebody who's reported from a lot of yeah. um, front lines, especially from the Muslim countries, I know that. That's what the Taliban. Ma done. Many what, of the, the Taliban give a statement many, saying they've done many it because of those Muhammad people done. were killing Muslims. Muslims, yes, exactly. And the, the, these are the, the good people that I identify with. For some reason, you are only identifying Muslims with the bad people. I, I'm not. What I'm identifying is that these attacks. 1,400 years later, they used the scripture to justify the attack. Now, what I'm saying is, when we see, and, and no one can explain it, and we're not even allowed to ask the question, what I want to do is prevent another generation of our daughters being raped. And if we have to ask serious questions to investigate why these Muslim males feel that they can do that, why brothers, if, in, in, to, one group of them, well, to celebrate Eid, they kidnapped a 15-year-old girl and gang raped her, and they, they said in court it was to celebrate Eid. Could you imagine a Christian celebrating Easter by kidnapping a Muslim child and gang raping her? I think Christians uh, have a very long history of uh, horrendous crimes. and uh, But not justifying it with their religion, not making comments of their religion, not making derogatory comments. And they, and they, are you killing me? <laughs> are, you are you kidding me? I mean, we, we don't have time to go into that, but there are I... plenty of historic examples of that. I want to ask you about this specific uh, case, the grooming case that you got yourself entangled with. Yes. And that was indeed an example of an ethnic gang specializing in sexual predation. The court... Uh, that court delivered or resulted in very, very harsh sentences. I, I think the defendants were collectively sentenced to over 220 years um, in not, prison. Not, not all of them. One of them's in Pakistan because they let him. The day, the, day, the, the, the day they put me in jail, but, they let the rapist but go home. By, by and large, the court recognized that it was indeed a, cap a campaign of rape against teenage yes. girls. Do you think justice was served in that case? Um, justice will be served if, if many of them who hold dual nationality are deported when they get out of prison. I formed the English Defence League to highlight these sorts of issues. It was a total cover-up. The British establishment, the British press were involved. The, the journalist who was given an award for exposing this in 2011 has admitted that he knew about it seven years prior. Everyone in our British establishment and British elite has facilitated and allowed our daughters to be raped through the fear of political correctness. Hey, Mr. Robinson, we have to take a very short break now. Okay. We will be back in just a few moments. Stay tuned.
welcome back to Worlds Apart with British activist Tommy Robinson. Mr. Robinson, just before the break, you were talking about this culture of silencing. And uh, I think in many countries, uh, the authorities do underreport those cases, specifically uh, be out of fear of encouraging ethnic hatred and that, or religious hatred, that happens in Russia as well. And I know for a fact that you haven't been uh, convicted of a hate crime, but a lot of your followers have crossed that line and took out the anger or frustration on people who did nothing wrong. Does it bother you? A lot of my followers. You some of your followers. Some of my followers. And it, would you say that somehow that would be my fault? Uh, no, I don't think it's your fault, but perhaps I would what, say what, that it what, should have encouraged wrote, you to be more specific what, in all your what about, if I, what about if I wrote a manifesto, and in that manifesto I told them they can attack people? Then would it be my fault? Yeah, but you can also tell them that, uh, you know, there I'm are people is, who are committing crimes and there are people who have nothing what, to do with that, and you should not take your anger out I, on I'm, those people. I'm not. What I'm saying is I, I have only ever called for peace. I've never called for violence. But we do have a book that calls for violence and promotes violence and promotes murder. And people were so quick to, to, to send me with what some of my so-called followers may have done. But then when it comes to Islam and you have a Muslim like who beheaded Lee Rigby and he hands over 55 verses in the Quran that he says forced him to do it, we're still not allowed to talk about Islam. We're not allowed. And, and as you said, I'm banned from every single social media, OK? That's not one. I'm banned from YouTube. I haven't got PayPal. I'm banned from all of them. We have laws in my country against inciting hatred. I've never been arrested for hate speech. I've never even been questioned about any hate speech or, or, or crimes. The truth, I was removed from Twitter for stating the fact that I've told you today. Muslim men make up 2%, they represent 84% of convictions. It's a fact. Anyone can look at it. That's not hate speech. So what we see now is the British establishment have hid these crimes. You said they were underreported. They've not been underreported. They've been hidden. And they hid them, and then they realised, because there was such furor on the streets for two years with the English Defence League, they realised they've got to now deal with it. So when, then they started making arrests, and in fact, if you look at the graph of when these arrests started, the, in the first, the first 11 years before the English Defence League formed, there were 11 arrests. The next year after the English Defence League formed, in that one year, there was, a there was 36 arrests, 40 arrests, 72 arrests. They've had to do something. But the full cover-up mode that they're still in is now, out of the last 49 trials, only, 40, only six have been openly reported on. Your main problem is not with a random person on the street, even if he or she happens to be a Muslim. No, to no totally. I, I grew up in Luton Town. Some of the best people I've met in my life are okay, Muslim. OK, so your, your main beef is, is with the British authorities who are uh, turning a blind <laughs> eye to this issue. Don't you think that by focusing on one particular group, in this case Muslims, you are making it all too easy for the British authorities to dismiss or deflect from a very legitimate issue that you are raising, that is how the immigration policies are being structured and the fact that many people feel that they have no say in how those policies are being formulated. Are, aren't you playing into their own hands? No, I will tell the truth, bluntly tell the truth and continue to do But are you more so. interested in bluntly telling something or actually having an impact? I've seen the over and window shift. I've seen it. Ten years ago, people called me an extremist. They said I was lying. They, even what I proved tomorrow in my speech, in 2010, I told the Times newspaper that Muslims were taking children into paedophilic prost prostitution rings with heroin. They called them extraordinary claims. Now all those journalists are catching up and they're reporting on it. Just as these are they issues... reporting it, uh, just as you formulated, Muslims are taking children into paedophilic ring? Um, yes, they're starting to. It's now common knowledge in my country, which it wasn't ten years ago. People said we were lying, OK? It's now proven... I mean, uh, how and, and would you even know that they're Muslims? I mean, for God's sake. I, I, I mean, I, I, I'll go through the comments from their court cases. The Somali gang, they said it was part of their culture to do this, OK? But, I mean, culture is not the same a, as faith. A, a, another Muslim said he was teaching the women a lesson for being out and being uncovered. You can take a verse in the Quran. There's a verse in the Quran that clearly states a woman must cover as to not be, to separate herself as to not be molested. But there are many other verses that uh, would tell you that humans and women have to be treated uh, in a good way. And can, I'm can, a good can, best can, can example you, of can, that now. Can you give uh, me one of those verses? Absolutely. I mean, my, my whole life is a proof of that. But uh, No, your I, whole I, life is a proof of, of, of a decent Muslim man that you're with. Not, uh, has which is to not do... an exception, which, which are the majority of the Muslim but what population. what I'm saying is that, that's not proof that Islam promotes that. That's not, that's not proof that the Quran promotes va values. I think you're... Extremely cherry picking, as I'm you telling, sometimes I'm, do, I'm, do I'm, with the I'm, facts. Let's talk about facts. immigration because I, th I think there is actually a substantive issue here, and I think that 
on that front, uh, the movement that you are representing is actually contributing to, to change. Uh, just the the other day, they, they, there was a Munich Security Conference, a large conference for NATO countries, and they produced a report called Westlessness, uh, in which they identified uh, nationalist aspirations as the sort of the biggest challenge to the so-called Western project. And they actually suggested that uh, many of those nationalist aspirations are driven by the immigration policies and the failure of the authorities to communicate and to engage the public effectively on those issues. Don't you think that you, you, you have actually contributed to that shift in perspective? Because I, I would agree with you, a few years ago, nobody would discuss immigration in detail, you would be accused of being a racist. You, you still are. <laughs> you still are accused of being... Well, essentially, if you went to the right school in the UK or you're from the right class, you, you're allowed to talk about it. If you're from a working-class background and you have an accent like I do, you're automatically deemed a, a racist or extremist. And the reality is that the towns and cities that that immigration affects is towns like where we live, it's areas... When I was born in 1982, we had one mosque. We now have 35. I've witnessed my whole entire ch town change and not for the better. There is less freedom. There is more trouble. We feel alienated in our own communities, and the whole time we're told that diversity is great whilst our daughters are being kidnapped and raped. Whilst we have, in Britain, we have 22,000 Muslims on a, on a terrorist watch list. 22,000. 3,000 of them are monitored 24 hours a day, seven days a week, at a cost of nine billion pounds a year. So the questions we're asking is, if, if we've already got all these problems, I think six refugees so far have committed terrorist attacks in Europe. Why are we still... Not if you had the choice, yes. how would you deal with that issue? Because you can, certainly, I mean, many of, of your Muslim neighbours are British citizens like yourself. Yes. Yep. What would you change to make your society a bit more mutually self-respectful? Uh, as respectful? I, I've said that in my hometown, we have every form of immigration. My mother was an Irish immigrant to, to the UK. We have St. Lucia. There was uh, also a long history of Irish violence, right? Do you, you know that? Uh, terrorism? Yeah. Uh, yes, but it, as you said, Irish violence. If it was Catholic violence, the Polish might have got involved or the Italians might have got involved. I mean, it, it was a war my, my, my point it is was that, a war that you know, violence is not exclusive to I, any particular when group, my, right? When my mum came to Luton, they had no blacks, no dogs, no Irish was on the doors. So I know about discrimination against people based, based on what other groups do. But what I'm saying is St. Lucian, Jamaican, Bulgarian, Italian, all of my friends... We, we have integration. It actually works with the different communities. The one section that does not mm -hmm. is the followers of Islam. And I'd say that's pretty much because we have 35 mosques, many of them funded by Pakistan, among, many of them funded by Saudi Arabia. We, we shouldn't take any Saudi I mean, money, Qatari money, Iranian money. That's, that's, that's a political money. problem. You understand that? That's not a religious problem. You're absolutely right. This country, for example, we also have, a, as I said to you before the recording, we have a large Muslim population, but the state does not allow the Saudi money to fund our mosques. Neither are Qatari monies uh, allowed here. <laughs> and that's done specifically to protect the local version of Islam from foreign influences. We that's a political problem. But what do... Ordinary Muslims have to do with that. Well, no, it's a religion. It's, uh, well, yeah, and 90% of the imams can't speak English. But when you're on about, say, in one borough of London, we have 32 boroughs of London. In one borough of London, and this, these children, not nine years old, were married in Sharia courts in the mosques, OK? So that's to do with the imam. They're, back, they're marrying children, which is against British law. They're marrying children. Some of these children... And I'll, I'll read this tomorrow. And this isn't from my view. This is from a women's rights... Kurdish women's but rights I mean, organisation. You, you have to throw that, not at... Again, not a, a, at a random Muslim on I'm the not street. Trying to, I'm you not, have to you're, you're confusing. lay it at the feet of the British government for allowing that to happen. And the promotion of child marriage under Islam and the promotion of paedophilia under Islam. It, it's... It's easy, and the British government, I do lay it at the British government for allowing it to happen. I lay it at the British, British government, the most recent terrorist, the most recent terrorist who just come out, who committed an attack recently, they knew he was going to do it, they were following him at the time, and he still got to stab two people. Our, our prisons in the UK are like ISIS training camps. I've been in them, OK? They have taken over our prison system, and they're radicalising Totally radicalising. 800 a year come out, according to our security but services. Mr Robinson, you understand that if you continue fuming about Islam, nothing is going to change. I mean, it's already the... changing. 
What is already changing? If you look at the biggest populist parties across Europe, they're all fuming about Islam. If you look at... Well, I, I, I mean, uh, fuming is one thing, but the actual change is another. Speaking of which, I know that the, uh, a few days ago, the British government has come up with a new immigration plan yes. based on uh, various points, which essentially would close the door to unskilled migrants who do not speak English up to a certain level. Do you think that plan goes far enough to address some of the problems uh, that you're concerned about? Personally, no. I, I think it's a, a great plan because anyone who's coming to our country should benefit our country, not come to our country and drain it. And the only people who should be allowed in should also be able to integrate and assimilate. And what we've seen, you've seen so Angela Merkel said that multiculturalism has failed. David, Mer M David Cameron said multiculturalism but failed. But you just said that it, it succeeded in I'm your about, own I'm community that. with I'm, the that, exception I'm, of Muslims. I'm about to say that, yeah. That is a weak and cowardly way of saying Islam has failed. Because the reality is, the Sikh community, the Hindu community, the Jewish community, the Polish, the Bulgarians, how hard is it for a Russian person to come to the UK? It's very easy for Pakistanis, Somalis, Afghanis, Iraqis. We'd much rather have immigration, which I think that when the Polish immigration come, in my hometown of Luton, I remember thinking how great it was. Because all of a sudden we had people who were culturally the same as us, hard-working, family values, the family value system in our country has been purposely targeted and broken down. The attack on Christianity, which we see, I even see our Christian leaders, we talk about the Church of England. I question if many of them even believe in Jesus Christ or whether they're using it for their own globalist well, agenda. You know, they're, they're, Muslims are still pretty strong on family values. I mean, they're... they're... I, know, no, I know they are. In fact, I went just last week to meet with some Muslims. There's, um, Muslims are protesting outside a school in the UK because they're now teaching uh, from the age of six that boys can be girls and girls can be boys and they're getting transgender... So they could be allies, exactly. And are, I mean, I, I, Russia is one example of where I we, we have them. a pretty good relationship between the various faiths. I mean, uh, is that not an argument for you to actually reframe your, you know, your campaign not being anti-Islam but more being anti-immigration or anti-stupid immigration? Um, Islam is a threat. Islam is incompatible with Western democracy and freedom. If, if someone takes Islam at its literal word, the, at its literal if word... Somebody if somebody takes bi the Bible as a literal word, it, it will get into the same type of trouble. If someone wants to live as Jesus lived, are they going to kill anyone? Because Muhammad murdered, Muhammad raped. So if someone believes Muhammad is the moral compass for them, and they believe he is perfect, well, he married Aisha when she was six, and he, and he raped her when she was nine. So that's a problem. Okay, and to say it's to, and to speak openly and freely about it shouldn't be a crime, or we shouldn't be attacked for well, it. People want to kill you, Mr. Why Robinson. Mo want... Most of the, most of, I'm non theist by the way, but most religious people do not take their scriptures uh, literally these days. Most, but then 20% are, are, are Islamist ideology. Uh, As well, I told they're you, also Christian fundamentalists. 22% but... are on a terrorist watch list. That's a small army. I promise you uh, an unedited broadcast, and this is what I'm going to give you. So that's why we have to leave it there. Thank you we very much for careful. coming over. <laughs> no, thank you. Well, and thank you for watching. Hope to see you again next Sunday on Worlds Apart.